uh, in just a moment. Oh, there we go, recording is underway. My name is Bruce Matthews. I'm the Executive Director for the Association of Consulting Engineering Companies Ontario, and I'll be moderating today's session. ACEC Ontario is a champion level partner in National Engineering Month. We're going to begin this session with a land acknowledgement. ACEC Ontario recognizes that its work, the work of its member companies, and the events of NEM 2023 take place on the traditional territories of a broad range of Indigenous peoples across the province. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this land, and we recognize the contributions that Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening this province and our country as a whole. We acknowledge that there are 46 treaties and other agreements that cover the territories now comprising Ontario. We are thankful to be able to work and live in these territories, and we pay our respects to the Indigenous elders past, present, and emerging. ACEC Ontario is the industry association representing the interests of consulting engineering companies in the province. Consulting engineering is not a discipline in itself, but it rather defines the relationship between the engineering service provider and the client. It's an arm's length relationship. The consulting engineer is not an employee of the client. And I would contrast that to a manufacturer who may have an in-house engineering department with staffs of PNGs. The goal of ACE, <coughs> excuse me, the goal of ACEC Ontario, <coughs> is to have our member companies prosper and be recognized for their influence and fundamental contributions to the social, environmental, and economic welfare of Ontario. Over 140 engineering firms in Ontario engage with us because their success is enabled by our leadership and advocacy and risk management because we provide networking opportunities and key support services. Now let me introduce our three professional engineer panelists for this session. Montana Wilson is the CEO and founder, founder of Grit Engineering, a civil and geotechnical engineering firm based out of Stratford, Ontario. Montana holds a BSc in civil engineering from Queen's University, an MEng in civil and environmental engineering from Western University, a business essential certificate from the University of Waterloo, and most recently an executive MBA from the University of Fredericton. Welcome, Montana. Kim Sayers is the Vice President of Water for RVA, also known as RV Anderson Associates, a multidisciplinary consulting engineering firm headquartered in Toronto, but with five other offices in Ontario and three in Atlantic Canada. Kim holds a BESC in Civil Environmental Engineering from Western University and an MASC in the same discipline from the University of Toronto. Thanks for joining us, Kim. Last but not least is Michael Oldham, the Senior Director of the Land Development Group at WSP, a global multidisciplinary engineering firm with offices on six continents and headquartered out of Montreal. Michael holds a BASC in Civil Engineering from the University of Waterloo and has been with WSP or its predecessor firms for over 31 years. We appreciate you taking the time to join us, Michael. So, I've got a number of questions for our panelists, but we will be allowing ample time at the end of this session for questions from our audience. If you do have a question, feel free to enter it at any time in the chat feature, and we'll do our best to address it during the Q&A session. So let's get started with Michael. Uh, tell us about your engineering journey to date, just in, in broad strokes. I've obviously talked about your education already, but. Take a couple of minutes to tell us about your employers and the roles since that time. And you're still on mute there, Michael. Hang on. There we go. Thank there you. Yes. Um, so started with uh, at the University of Waterloo. I uh, did my work terms all in the land development field. Um, I spent uh, a couple with GM Cernus uh, doing uh, field surveying and inspection, um, later with Taunton Simshubiki and uh, doing uh, site inspections on behalf of municipalities. And then uh, final ones were with Marshall McMonaghan uh, 
doing design back then of course uh triangles paper mylar pencil um no cad whatsoever um i then joined marshall macklin uh which was about a 400 person firm after graduating in uh, 1991 um we became mmm group uh about 2000 employees ultimately i became a manager and a partner with mmm group um we were then acquired by WSP in 2016. Uh, WSP was about 40,000 employees then, and it's over 60,000 today. Um, so the interesting you know, part that uh, beyond the engineering and now the administrative side of involved in, you know, certainly saw CADs from the beginning uh, in probably in 90, 1992, uh, evolve through uh, into land development desktop and civil 3D today, which we use uh, quite an evolution of, uh, you know, from paper to now having 3D objects that really represent uh, what uh, the uh, they are, whether it's a pipe, a manhole, etc. Um, the other side of it is, um, and talk a little bit more about later um, at MMM, you know, very important learning the financial side, um, which I was interested in in university. And, uh, you know, certainly that part of the business, uh, very important as you go through. And, and it sort of helped my career all the way through to where I am today and helped me get uh, to the position I'm currently at. Super. Appreciate that. All right, Kim, same question for you. I believe you've been at RVA for your entire career, but what path ultimately led you to being a VP? And you're also, let me just see what we can do for you here. Oh, there we go. Oh, there I think, yeah, I think the host has to help. Um, yeah, so I went to, to Western for my undergrad and then wasn't, you know, wasn't really sure what to do with myself after undergrad. So I decided, okay, well, I'll continue to do some school. And so I decided to do my master's at the University of Toronto. And that got me into drinking water treatment. And it was, you know, it's kind of a, a different side of things that I hadn't really been exposed to much in undergrad. Um, and so through the, the master's program, met a number of people in the industry. Um, and then I was hired on by RVA Anderson right away back in 2005. Um, so at RVA, I've been working my way up the ladder, I guess, over time, learning as much as I can. I started as a um, an EIT helping with design development for a drinking water treatment plant in Smith Falls, um, you know, working as a uh, project management assistant, doing multidisciplinary design coordination and doing the process design of that facility. Um, and then over time, worked my way up into through different roles in the project, you know, taking on more responsibility on the specific design, getting to the point where I was dealing the process designs, and being the project manager for the projects, the main client contact, uh, helping shepherd the projects through to meet the client's expectations and make sure that we've got you know the right disciplines and the right um, the right teams involved from RVA side. Um, and then a few years ago, I moved up into a staff manager in a principal role, and then um, last year became an associate vice president of our water group, and now I am vice president of our water and wastewater group. Um, still involved heavily in the engineering side. Uh, we're a company of about 410 people or so. Uh, we are growing, but due to our size, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of um, what kind of work our, our, the individuals can do. And so, you know, I'm still involved in a, a QA type role, as well as sometimes the lead process engineer um, and training and mentoring, as well as the corporate and the business side of things. Super. All right, moving on to Montana. I think your path's been a little bit different from Kim's and Michael's. Tell us about your journey to starting your own consulting engineering firm. Sure. Thanks, Bruce. You can hear me. All yep. right. Perfect. Um, so I graduated, as you said, uh, from Queens in 2008. I did do a couple summer work terms before then, uh, generally in materials testing, so concrete, soil, and asphalt. It's a great place to start and learn about construction if any of you are at that point. Um, and from graduating, uh, was employed by Naylor Engineering, which no longer exists. The current name is Englobe, um, and was there for about eight years before going to another firm to do civil engineering. So the first eight years of my career 
generally largely geotech and environmental, uh, and then switching disciplines and moving over to the civil side, uh, more linear infrastructure. Uh, from there, I went to Bruce Power for a year on the nuclear side, managed their civil and security team, and then opened GRIT about a year and a half ago, uh, formally. So GRIT is a small, uh, smaller engineering firm, although we've done a lot of growing in the last year and a half. Uh, we're up to 22 staff oh. with three divisions, civil, geotech, and surveying. Um, I would say... So my role a little bit different, um, 2011 was when I was licensed, but that's also the year that I became the team leader for the Stratford office uh, with Naylor Engineering. So very much in a management role early in my career and have been since that time. Um, I still on the day-to-day -day stamp drawings and still very much involved in the technical, both on the civil and geotech side. I find having multi-disciplines really has helped me in my career and helps my clients um, from that perspective because the linear infrastructure and the geotech very much related uh, in the design work. So that's a little bit about me. Super. All right. Well, we're going to stay with you. Um, as you'd mentioned, you've got your license back in uh, 2011. Do you recall the first time that you actually applied your seal to a, to a drawing or a document? And can you maybe tell us about uh, what the project was and how you felt at the time, the first time you actually used your seal? Uh, so I just remember thinking, okay, that was it. Like, now I'm good. Um, so I don't feel any smarter than I did yesterday. Today. Um, but I was fortunate and, and continue to be fortunate to have great mentors in my career. Um, I think that's very important starting out. So I did, I wasn't nervous to use it. I felt like I had enough technical knowledge at that point to stamp the things I was being asked to stamp and review. Um, I, uh, yeah, I think that's that's all I need to say there. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting. I went. I didn't have any. I was a, on a pretty clean route, right? I went to school in Canada to a Canadian university, um, and didn't have to really overcome a lot of hurdles to get licensed. I just had to put the time in. Um, unlike some other um, people we have that even work with us that that are experienced large hurdles in licensing right now. Um, from that, what else I wanted to say about that? Um, I think that it is every single day when we stamp something still, there really has to be that acknowledgement that you trust the people that are generally doing all of the design work for you. Yes, you're at the end and you're doing your final review. Um, but at this level, we don't, we don't get in the weeds too much. You have to have confidence in your staff and the people you hire and provide that good mentoring in order to have confidence um, that everything you're stamping as a licensed engineer is going through in the proper direction. Absolutely. Super. So Kim, uh, you were licensed in 2009. What are your recollections about the first time you applied your seal? Uh, well, after stamping all my textbooks <laughs> and trying it out. Uh, yeah, it was a, a reservoir project in Brant County where I did the process design and similar to Montana, it was just like, it's really, I'm, I'm staffing this now. Like I'm all of a sudden, you know, totally qualified and responsible for it. It's, you know, um, and I look back and I think, okay, well, there's some things I would have done differently in that design now that I've got, you know, a lot more experience, but um, yeah, there's a gravity to the situation when you're stamping something, you know, you do have to make sure that you're, that you've done your due diligence and you've made sure that you've done the, the proper quality control reviews and it's, um, that it, it is a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, just a quick follow-up. How long between the time you actually sort of received your license and received your seal to the first time you used it? I know firms Not are often- Not very long. I was gonna say yeah. firms are often interested in getting the PNGs to be PNGs right off the bat as soon as yeah. you've got the ability to do so. So yeah. uh, we usually do co-seal though. So if somebody's early in their engineering career, like um, they'll seal it and then I would usually review and co-seal it with them, especially if they're, you know, just received their PN during the first couple right. of years. Right. Fair enough. So, Michael, we're going to wind the clock back a bit further from Kim, go <laughs> further 16 years back to 1993 when you were licensed. So, uh, as you'd already alluded to, very different era in terms of technology and the engineering business. But what was the first project that uh, you used your seal on and how do you how did you recall feeling at the time? I was uh, 
yeah, it was always a big deal at Marshall Mac when you got your seal and I was very excited about it. It was uh, a low rise residential subdivision in Oakville. So nothing, uh, we, we always joke, no rocket science, but uh, you know, still uh, lots of critical things. Uh, just sort of back to Montana's point, um, you know, a lot of times now reviewing drawings and I, I always will ask people and they hand them to me. Okay, if you were stamping it, you know, would you stamp this drawing before you hand it to me? Uh, so thinking back to that perspective, the interesting part is I'm still working on that same project. Uh, it's evolved from the low rise into lane based uh, residential multi use retail now high rise residential and office and we're actually going back and redeveloping the retail areas uh, parking lots into be high rise residential. Um, but the best part was um, we had to do a pipeline crossing. Uh, in that subdivision and submit the TransCanada pipelines. And the uh, reviewer received it and immediately ran a couple floors away to show my dad who spent his entire career with TransCanada pipelines. And he could show the drawing to uh, to him with my uh, seal on it. So that was an added bit of an excitement when uh, dealing with that project. Fantastic. And I think Montana, you've alluded to, I mean, and I assume all three of you are, are still applying your seal today. And I'm just wondering, you know, is the context different, Kim, is, is you know, relative to, you talked about co-sealing, of course, as a, a junior engineer, you know, do you use your seal today and in what context? Uh, yeah, still, still seal things today, um, seal reports and drawings and specifications. Um, the difference between now and before is that I'm not, you know, the usually not the main engineer on it. I'm more in a QA type role or a mentorship and a um, development type role. So when the the person who doesn't have a PNG, if I'm if they're the, the main sort of designer on it, then I have to do much more due diligence, make sure that um, I'm comfortable sealing it. But then, um, you know, just like Montana said earlier, trust is really essential. Um, when you're working with somebody and uh, whether you're co-sealing or you're sealing work that they had had prepared. So there is the time that you need to take to do your due diligence, make sure that you're satisfied with it and make sure that all the major risks have been addressed. Super. And Michael, here we are 30 years later from your initial licensure, you're still using your seal? Still, still using my seals. Some of them on those historic projects that have never gone away and uh, still some, uh, I'll say very often the smaller projects where uh, I still might be working with a graduate engineer um, and reviewing their work and sealing it. The bigger projects, you know, I may be on as a client contact, um, but usually there's a team there and there'll be probably somebody with 15 years experience that is kind of between me and the team um, that I'm supporting that will review and seal. But uh, yeah, it's probably still... You know, maybe not every week, but probably every second week, uh, the okay. seal is still used. Excellent. And Montana, for yourself, again, smaller firm. So I'm not sure how many other PNGs you have on your staff. Um, yeah. So we have two other PNGs and um, an EIT, but I use mine um, pretty much every day, maybe every other day, but very often. We do lots of little stuff in and out the door, lock grading plans, et cetera, that um, require a quick review and, and PN stamp. We do do larger projects as well, but there's lots of lots of little stuff that we get out the door daily. Fantastic. So we do have three very different firms, rep <clears throat> excuse me, firms represented here in terms of size and disciplines and geographic scope of practice. Uh, I'd like to explore with each of you, what is the typical day in the life of a professional engineer at your firm? You know, what kind of projects and tasks are they engaged in? And I appreciate you may need to differentiate between a junior engineer and intermediate versus a senior, but uh, Montana, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, you know, what's what's that day in the life? Uh, so I'll kind of start in the morning. I have two kids, um, <laughs> so, right, and two dogs and a cat and a husband. So it's a bit chaotic in my house in the morning, get everybody's lunches ready and then get out the door. Um, so that, that, I would say, and I say that because we have a lot of flexibility in the consulting engineering field in order to make those things happen and to juggle your work-life balance, whatever that looks like. Um, so I take a bit more time in the morning to get everybody ready. Um, and then I generally go in the office every day. So at um, GRID, we do have a remote work policy. So everybody has the ability to work wherever they need to work for the day. 
whether that's home or in the office, but I do enjoy coming into the office. Um, my day largely now is uh, generally reviews and meetings, um, at just with my role, um, not very much in the weeds, uh, but I have a client meeting at lunch and a team design meeting this afternoon, for an example. Um, from there, I am part of the ACEC board, part of the local builders association board. So we often have events um, throughout the day or even at night that we meet as a committee. So there is that component to uh, my, my career as well. Um, and then just managing the business side. Um, so whether that's um, looking, reviewing the bookkeeping or um, do, doing year end financials right now or doing strategic forecasting um, is all part of what I do for a living. Um, so very, very diverse, I would say, in my day to day, every every day looks different, we could be traveling to Ottawa, we could be going down to Windsor or coming into the office, which is Stratford is home for us. Fair enough. And I do appreciate, you know, it's, it's tough to suggest a, a typical day because everything is so different. But it, I think that really helps convey uh, at a small firm sort of the level that you're engaged in. Kim, let's move on to you. What's a, uh, a typical day in the life for an, an engineer at RVA? Uh, so for, at the higher level, very similar to Montana's, you know, meetings all day long and fire, like fighting fires, managing risks and, and things like that. But um, I guess I can focus more on like a junior engineer and what type of role that they would have. And so our group, we do mostly vertical infrastructure, which means like facilities, the pumping stations, treatment plants, um, storage facilities for water and wastewater. Uh, municipal projects. And so our team, we try to get people involved in all sorts of different aspects of the projects. Um, they typically start with class environmental assessments. So there's, you know, the studies, they're looking at the natural environment, um, all the different, uh, you know, for environmental quadrants that we look at for class EAs to identify what should, they, which direction should the municipality go in terms of the type of solution they're looking for. And so our junior engineers would be involved in coordinating those studies and authoring those studies. Um, and then we would move on to, you know, the preliminary design, um, setting out the design parameters for the different types of projects that we're doing. So for example, for a water treatment plant, it would be, what are our treatment objectives? What type of treatment processes are we going to use? And then how do we build the plant around that? So what are the, uh, what are the structural considerations, geotechnical, site civil, mechanical, controls and instrumentation, electrical, and so on. And so our, our junior engineers would be uh, coordinating that effort as well as looking at the process side of things. Um, so there's a lot of learning that goes on every day and it's very project-based. Um, so whatever the project needs is what you'd be involved in, whether it's going for a site visit to look at existing conditions um, or through to, you know, after it's been designed and it's out in construction, you could be going to site and reviewing what's happening on site with the construction process or involved in contract administration. Um, there's learning different disciplines outside of your core discipline, especially when you need to coordinate, you know, if you're electrical, if you have a pump, the electrical needs to know how, how big that motor is so that they have their system sized appropriately. So there's a lot of coordination, a lot of communication um, and a ton of learning um, every day for, for a junior engineer. Super. All right, Michael, over to you. Uh, huge firm like WSP, I can appreciate, um, uh, I gather you folks gather, uh, support projects that are not only across the country, but quite possibly across the planet. So what's a, what's a typical day? If, I realize you could probably take an hour trying to answer this if you look at the various levels and the things that you guys are engaged with, but just give us a general sense of, of uh, what what is it that a PNG at WSP does? Sure. Uh, just quick note back on Montana. Montana's is I have two kids as well, but uh, one's a graduate engineer, uh, and the other one is in third year engineering. So uh, my life is a, a, a little simpler now than it was <laughs> back then. But uh, the flexibility of working for a consulting engineer made a lot possible. They went through rep hockey, rep baseball. I coached them. Uh, not possible without the type of environment that allows you that flexibility. Um, but, you know, I, I sort of broke it mentally down into three tiers, you know, a junior engineer, and depending on the scale of the project, new PNG, they would, you know, smaller project, they might be alone doing the design with a more senior engineer sort of supervising. Um, but on a bigger project, 
they may have a number of graduate engineers and techs working with them going through it. They realistically will spend a lot of their day in civil 3D and Excel working through the design, um, coordinating with the other members of that team and dealing with that key element. As Kim said, they'll get out to the site uh, somewhere early in the project, see it, see the realities of what's on the ground. And uh, we try to get the entire team out. So they take a look. Google Maps and Street View certainly helps, but uh, there's nothing like being there. Um, the intermediate engineer will probably still be doing uh, design work day to day. They probably spend more time on re uh, reports, uh, functional servicing reports, those type of things, giving guidance to the uh, more junior team members. Uh, but they'll then also spend more time working on proposals, the review of the project financials, and then the coordination with other teams inside WSP or outside WSP. Um, you know, in, in our field, we deal with uh, planners, architects, uh, all kinds of other consulting engineers all the time. Um, and that coordination is going on. The senior engineer, if they're lucky, they're probably still, still doing a bit of design. Um, those are kind of a peaceful day when you actually get to do a bit. Um, I was actually redlining some drawings today, um, but uh, most time it's a lot of meetings um, and then providing guidance to the team. They'll have more work on proposals, business development, project financials, uh, coordinating with the teams, clients, uh, approval agencies, et cetera. Um, you know, in many cases, the senior engineers also have other administrative roles. They may be a team lead, manager, director, um, and they'll also have those administrative things to do, uh, you know, in between their day job. Super. Well, it's pretty clear that, you know, technical engineering skills are clearly vital to the success uh, in those particular roles. But I'm wondering what other skills you would say are actually critical for professional engineers who are working at consulting engineering firms. Um, Kim, let's start with you. Sure, communication is number one. Like you need to be able to understand what your client needs, what their needs are, what their drivers are, what you know, what a successful project to them looks like, and then to be able to communicate that to your design team. And the people that you're working with so that they understand the scope of work, the budgets, the schedules, the timelines that we have to do things. Um, and so I think communication is really fundamental to every aspect of what we do. And then you just build on that um, to take on more and more responsibility, you know, managing the relationship with the client, um, managing the project and managing multidisciplinary and large engineering teams. Um, yeah, it's a communication that is fundamental and also listening, you know, like communication, it's not just one way. It's, it's really um, sometimes knowing when not to talk and when to listen more and not being afraid to ask questions because, you know, all of us, I think are, are there's so there's so many areas that we can't be experts in everything. Right. So you're not expected to know everything. So make sure that you're asking questions when you when you don't know something and getting and getting feedback and getting help to manage risks. Super. I think, yeah, that, that two-way aspect of communication is, you know, absolutely key. You need to be listening to understand client needs and, uh, and the like. So, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Thanks. Michael, over to you. What, uh, what additional skill set do you think is important? Yeah, so certainly, you know, uh, communication is very important. You know, the one that, uh, that develops beyond that, you know, is uh, time management. Uh, you know, we start off, you, you know, nice easy first day you might be working on one project and maybe you run that way for a while next thing you know it's five to ten ten to twenty and beyond um, and how do you manage that how do you deliver uh, based on the time frames go to your meetings etc cetera, etc cetera. so very important to learn those skills how to manage your time and then the, then the other one is uh, you know relationships uh, managing uh, relationships with clients approval agencies consultants they're so important to move projects forwards uh, communicate your ideas if you have those relationships and you know each other and you understand how to develop those relationships it's very helpful for your projects and for your career super and what's your perspective montana uh, all of the above, but I would just add um, knowing your audience from a communication standpoint. So you can be the smartest person in the world, but if you can't communicate your idea, then it's worth nothing. 
Um, so often we write technical reports and guidance um, to people that don't have any technical background. So you need to be able to, there's an art form to communicating um, your project in a way that your audience can understand that, whether that's an approval agency, your client, um, or municipality in my, in our case. Right. Okay. Um, really good perspectives. Appreciate that. Now, consulting engineering firms, of course, are independent businesses. And I'd like your views on how important it is for your professional engineers to also have some level of business acumen. Uh, you know, are they involved in, in business development and seeking out new clients? Uh, and if so, in what way? And do you view you know, all of your PN staff as sort of both, you know, clearly needing to do and deliver the technical work, but ultimately they are representatives of the firm and, and you know, have a, a, a role to play in, in how you're perceived as an organization. What's your, what are your thoughts on that? Let's start with um, Michael. Yeah, so, you know, uh, for, first part on the business side is we get into project financials and that part very early in their career, even before they become professional engineers. You need to understand, you know, their time spent relating back to the budgets with the clients. But then, as you said, the next step is then that relationship with the clients. And we will have, again, even before the prof professional engineers, we'll have them involved in meetings, getting comfortable being in there, uh, as Kim said, listening, uh, learning and understanding and, and getting to know that audience of your client. Um, and then we encourage, you know, you know, the one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's lunch, whatever, those type of events with clients, but also get involved in uh, other groups, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, and joining, joining those outside groups, committees where there's social events. Um, I know, uh, Young Build is one that's very popular on my team, uh, where they can connect with, uh, you know, uh, engineers, clients, etc., for across the industry, uh, at, at social events where there are comfortable conversations, and then that just makes it much, that much easier for them when they're dealing with clients on a, on a business perspective. And the other one is approval agencies. Uh, sometimes they are also our clients, um, but you know, sometimes they're just working in that. You know, uh, it's so much easier to work with them if you develop that relationship. So it's uh, both the client and uh, then those entities as well. Super. Uh, Montana, your thoughts? Uh, I might have a little bit of a different take on it, but I think that we need to elevate people in what they're good at and what they like doing. Um, so sometimes as a consulting engineer, um, I've seen really good technical engineers pushed into management roles and um, corporate roles that they end up hating and not enjoying. Um, so I think you really need to do have some self-awareness of what you want your career to look like. Um, there is real value in having really strong technical people and having them full-time in technical roles and having someone else manage the business side of it. So I think it really depends on what your firm is, what your group is. Um, and what you enjoy doing. I am a true believer in elevating those people in the directions at which they want to be elevated in. So um, being a manager is not for everyone um, and it is for some of us. So I think just be aware of what you like doing and what you want to do every single day. All right. Interesting perspective. Thank you. And Kim, any thoughts on roles of professional engineers and business acumen and so on? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very good point, Montana. I agree, especially for smaller firms. Sometimes you like people do get elevated beyond their their comfort zone. But I I do believe that everybody should have a basic business acumen in terms of managing budgets, understanding the efficiency of your your charge out rate, and how much time you have. Um, but also in terms of business development, um, I think our our industry is primarily about trust. And so by doing good work, we're doing business development by, you know, giving good quality work, being responsive to our clients. That's a huge part of business development because, you know, they, our clients are expecting us to be there, to be the experts that, you know, they're paying us to be. So just showing up and doing a good job is often the biggest part of business development and getting repeat clients and repeat business. Right. And I think that's really what's key is, is you know, 
the better relationship you develop, uh, the less effort you have to do to be getting that next piece of business from them, right? Just by virtue of the reputation you've established, then uh, then hopefully they just come to you directly and and, and off you go. And, I, and Michael, I think just as we were doing the prep work for this, you'd mentioned you've got clients that you've had for, you know, 30 years that just they come straight to you. They don't go an RFP process anymore. They'll just, they just know who they want. And based on your performance and that relationship elements, um, that's sort of what drives it. Absolutely. Um, and it's interesting, Montana, just on, on your comments there. I mean, yeah, I don't know that there's anything, uh, shall we say natural that makes professional engineers into business managers by any means. I think there's, that's not sort of a, an ingrained skill, notwithstanding the engineering economics that we all take in through the, uh, through the undergraduate program, but it doesn't necessarily translate to business skills. And I can certainly see those paths where if you want to focus on the technical, you know, after 15, 20 years, you're kind of the guru of, of your technical area, but you're not a, a business person. And therefore people who are, are better qualified or better suited, be it, you know, because they're more extroverted or whatever else, um, go into those roles. So that's interesting. Now, a lot of our audience here today are either engineering students or recent engineering graduates. So I'm wondering what advice you would give uh, to, to someone like that who might be interested in consulting engineering as a career. You know, what are the, the positive things that you think uh, the nature of this business would, would be attractive? And certainly let's, let's be fully upfront. You know, what are the, the risks and, and pitfalls, shall we say, that, uh, that relate to the business as well? Um, Montana, we'll start with you. Oh, that's a good one, Bruce. Um, so why I love consulting engineering is it's different day to day. It allows me to be on site. I work with clients. It's very, uh, has a lot of, ha has a lot of diversity built into it. Um, I would say that it's been great for me to have the flexibility in order to expand my um, knowledge. Like both master's degrees I did were at night. Um, a couple day courses here and there, but it still allowed me to work full time, uh, as well as, you know, raise my kids are still little um, and have that flexibility. So I think that that is a really key um, role to this job is that you, you don't have to be at the plant from nine till five. Um, we definitely have options to provide flexibility as an, as, as an industry. Um, but then it allows you to have a lot of freedom in what you want to do. Um, you can go in a million different directions with consulting engineers. You're the ones that are designing and stamping those projects nine times out of 10. Um, and you're not just reviewing it. You're making the big decisions. Um, and you get to kind of play around with that, um, do innovative things. And, and I think that's a good reason why you should go into it. I would encourage anybody um, that's on this call to just reach out and even get a summer job in it. Um, even if it's not the field, I hear so much um, in interviews, well, this isn't, you know, I'm thinking about doing structural. I don't really see the value in doing geotechnical for four months, but regardless of what discipline it is, it will teach you a lot. Um, so do, do summer jobs, do co-ops, even if you don't think that's the end field you want to get into, um, take the uh, take those opportunities now because you will learn a lot just in general about how construction works and how projects are managed. There's lots of skills that are transferable from that. So that would be my advice. Fantastic. Kim, what would you have to say to uh, engineering student or graduate who might be thinking about consulting engineering? I agree. We do the fun stuff. So we get to do the project. We run the project. We, you know, we get to make all the big technical decisions and then you get to see it built, which is, is pretty amazing too. On the client side, you know, they don't always, they can give direction and give, give input, but really we're the ones that are kind of creating the, the whole masterpiece. Um, so that part of it is exciting and it's different every day and it's very project-based. So, you know, you can have some really fascinating one-off projects and then um, some other projects that might be sort of run in the mill, but they all have their own individual unique components. Uh, so that's the best part about consulting. I think some of the challenges in consulting are, you know, maybe the workload and, and hours. And so, like Michael mentioned earlier, like time management is really important. So understanding, you know, how long it takes to do things, setting your boundaries. And so you can maintain that work-life balance. Like, 
most consulting firms are fairly flexible. I've got two young kids myself too. And so I definitely, my mornings are mayhem as well. Um, and just having the flexibility to be able to, to deal with life and try and balance things is great. But I think it does take a bit of um, personal discipline as well to be able to manage um, to manage that. And I think some other advice I could give would be, you know, if you do get into consulting is just learn as much as you can. So, you know, at, in any opportunity, any job you have, take, take the time to understand what, you know, maybe senior reviewers are talking about, do your own research, do your own reading, just understand as, as best you can um, to grasp all the different technical areas and all of the other, the management areas as well. Um, from my experience, it, it's taken a good 10 years to get really confident in the business, to understand all components of it, the technical, and then also looking at project management, risk management, um, and the business side of things. So, you know, I think it, it really just does take a lot of the time and effort that you put into it to get to really understand the business. Right. So take every opportunity. Yeah, no, good point. I mean, the Achieving your PN, getting your license is not a destination, right? It's really, it's really a starting point. I always like to think of it, um, you know, I used to work for, for PEO on the regulatory side. It's your license to learn, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. It doesn't make you, you know, yes, you've got a certain authority and accountability when you use it, but it's really just your starting point of a journey and, and learning clearly is, is part of that throughout, uh, throughout the career. Michael, over to you. What's your advice for, uh, for new grads and, and students? Yeah, you know, certainly for me, those co-op terms were helped guide me where I wanted to go and, and, you know, spending the time out in the field and construction and interesting. My two sons, one's nanotech, the other one's mechatronics, but they're both spending summers doing uh, construction engineering services type stuff. So um, a lot you can learn that way by being out there, but going back to design. But it, as both said, it, it's exciting every day, you know, we have our regular projects, but then you have things such as Rogers Center, uh, Air Canada Center, Terminal 3, Wonderland, uh, all kind of neat stuff that you're involved in. It may have nothing to do with what your discipline is, but you're there, you see it. Um, there's all kinds of amazing stuff. And it's great to be, in my opinion, on this side, the design, you know, right in it as opposed to you know, I, I would be challenged on, say, the approval side, where I'm just looking at what other people do. Um, you know, I want to be involved where the action is, and you get to be involved with lots of people, you know, lawyers, architects, planners, real estate, uh, you know, it's all kinds of things you deal with every day. Outside of engineering, that just makes it exciting. Um, but for the, you know, when you're in there, uh, the biggest thing I say is, take control of your career. Like Kim said, look to learn, right? Okay, I'm doing this now, but how can I learn the business side? How can I help with this proposal? Um, can I do this? Get on committees, right? People will know you. They will get, you'll get to know people. You'll get connections, all important stuff to keep moving your career along. Um, but I think, you know, the senior team wants you to advance your career. They'll be there to mentor you. They'll give you tools, but you need to take responsibility for it and, and make sure you're driving your career forward. And as you meet people, do all this stuff, as Kim also said, you're going to get more confident in what you do. You're sitting in a meeting with 12 people and you're the one speaking. Now you're comfortable in that uh, environment. Not normally natural for engineers, you know, tend to be a little more introverted in general, and it takes some time for that to develop. Uh, but it's important that you get there. Um, so I think uh, do that and that it'll help with develop all those relationships we talked about earlier. Super. I think one sort of common theme that came across was just that variety of work, you know, from, from a project perspective. And uh, Michael, as you've alluded to, it could be large, it could be small. Uh, I suspect within WSP, I, I know you're engaged in projects that have construction values into the billions, literally, quite literally billions. Uh, but I, I strongly expect you've also got projects you're engaged with where, you know, it's it's in the tens of thousands of dollars, maybe kind of thing, right? And and Kim yeah. in Montana, I imagine the same thing that there's some, you know, Kim or Montana, I don't think you're in the billions yet. You're working there. That's good. <laughs> um, but But still, it's just this idea that, you know, Projects come in large and small. Um, you know, there's the ones that are going to last 
two weeks and there's one that's going to last two years, right? It's all that kind of variety that kind of comes into play that no two days are ever the same. And I think that's part of the big attraction. And if that's what drives someone, then clearly the, the consulting sector is something that's, uh, that should be attractive. All right, we've got about 15 minutes left, a little less. I'm going to move on to a couple of questions that appeared up in the chat. Um, David Sanders says, you know, I'm struck that our panel have all moved to managerial roles. At what point in their careers did they make that move? And did they wish they'd spent more time studying business and managerial topics, like perhaps an MBA or a PMP? Um, Kim, let's start with you on that one. Ah, that's an interesting point. I never, like, contrary to what the recommendations were, I didn't I didn't really have, I guess, super goals on what I wanted to do and what, what position I wanted to have. But I just had amazing mentorship. And I think they saw the possibilities and, I guess, the potential for me. And so I was kind of shepherded along this path. And um, so it, it, it made a lot of sense and I agreed with it and I was really happy with it, but it, what I didn't have that sort of five or 10 year goal in mind. But I, again, I was really super fortunate to have amazing mentors. Um, for the business side of things, I think, you know, having an MBA could help, but I don't think it's critical for what we do, um, especially if you're working with a team of people. It's, you know, just like the engineering, you're learning the business side from day one and you're picking up a little bit as you go. Um, I do have a PMP, so I do think that that's valuable um, from a project manager perspective and our clients are also asking for that as well. But, um, you know, again, it's, it's, there are also things that you can learn on the job. So I don't think it's a, it's a make or break. Right, fair enough. Michael, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I was gonna say, going through university, I did have the business side as the as kind of the minor uh, going through, and I actually debated in high school. I did all the high school accounting stuff, so there's a bit of a debate there. But engineering went out, so the more you can get that, um, you know, uh, I thought about the MBA, um, and if I was brave enough as Montana and started my own business, uh, I might have gone down that path. But uh, you know, I think with, uh, as Kim said, with all the mentorship and the people and, and what we learn day to day, um, I, I, it really wasn't necessary for me in my role uh, from that perspective. Um, but, you know, um, I had a classmate who I still work with. We've worked together now. We uh, graduated together. We started at Marshall Macon together. Um, we both kind of reached the managerial side you know, kind of the seven to 10 year area in our career, probably around seven. Um, and we both did that for a while. And then we went different routes. I continued down the, the manager side. He became our technical expert. And, you know, today he, ha he doesn't have, he has business development, he has client relationships, project uh, accountability on the financials, but he doesn't have uh, administrative role or staffing role but he is our mentor technically to everybody in the group. Um, so, you know, it's not an immediate thing. You can go down these paths and take different routes as you go when you feel, as Montana was saying earlier, where you're comfortable and uh, where your skills and what you want to do. And, and some reach near the end, the last five years, they may pull out of the uh, managerial side and go back to the technical side and, just uh, enjoy some engineering at the uh, at the tail end of the career that happens uh, uh, in our group as well. So uh, it doesn't have to continue one one path. Uh, it can change over time. Right. And in Montana, I'm just going to expand on this little question a bit and maybe get your perspective. You know, management within the context of of consulting engineering firms, I tend to think of project management as different from people management. So I'm curious in your own experience. You know, how many years after you were a PN were you doing project management activities and when did you start, when were you first assigned people management? Um, so I would say in the same year, um, but project management probably like honestly within the first year of being out in consulting full time to some degree you're man always managing your project. Uh, people management formally became a team leader in 2011, the same year that I received my PN. So have been in a people management role from there. 
I've largely went to small firms um, to medium sized firms like the largest firm I worked for was um, from consulting was 300 people when I was there so um, the management, both on the people project management, and the technical were all kind of always there for me. So it's not like I was stuck in one role or the other, which is part of the reason I love it because it's so diverse. You're dealing with different issues every day. Um, I do have my executive MBA. Um, and that means that I have 10 years of management experience before I applied to do my MBA. So they give you some credits. Um, and that's why they call it an EMBA. And I do my PMP, but all of the extra learning I've done since my undergrad has all been because I have such a passion to do it. So if you don't love <laughs> business and learning and wanting to do that, you're not going to stay up till midnight working on your papers for your MBA, right? So I would say, I don't know that it was just so focused on getting ahead in the business. For sure, it taught me a lot of things, um, but it, it was more that I had a passion to learn more. Um, the MBA, particularly, I was with non-engineers, so it gave me a lot of good perspective on how other businesses are run and how we could maybe do things differently in the consulting engineering uh, field. So uh, I, I saw a lot of value there. I worked CEOs of hospitals to senior VPs at RBC and, and a bunch of other different type of corporations. So it just it gave you time to kind of reflect on how you do things and, and if you would do them differently. Super, appreciate that. Um, next question might be our last one based on the time here, but it's actually a really good issue to, to raise in this context. Uh, opportunities for internationally qualified engineers in the consulting sector here. How much past experience in the consulting role or the role of engineering business helps to fit into the Canadian work environment? So let's just make this more generally about uh, looking at, at candidates and, and people because we're all, there's, there's a, what we call a war for talent going on right now. Everyone's looking for bodies to, to get engineering work done. Um, sort of what advice would you have for an internationally qualified individual uh, in terms of A, joining the firm and maybe any experience with respect to uh, licensure as well? Um, Michael, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, and we have in, in our group, a number of foreign trained engineers and a lot of them went the Canadian master's route. Um, so they did a master's degree in Canada. That certainly makes things a lot easier with the PEO. Um, it is challenging. Um, you know, other ones have had to go through courses, exams, that that challenge to get licensed. But we don't, you know, and we help them with that uh, financially. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, from that perspective, the interesting part in, in our sector, um, not done the same way much around the world. Um, so we don't get too concerned on direct experience. Um, there tends to be a general water wastewater experience and, um, you know, I was gonna say a, a little bit helps, um, but it, it's, you know, not necessary. We hire a lot of new grads every year, just plain and simple. Uh, obviously most of them hopefully were uh, co-op students, summer students, you have that past experience with them. Um, and some of those were even international students. So I think uh, don't be afraid to. Uh, the roles are there. As you said, Bruce, everybody's hunting for people. And, uh, you know, um, that, you know, interviews are tough, but it's important to have a good conversation in the interview and, uh, you know, get across communication skills and, you uh, we're uh, happy to give people a chance. Super. Montana, your thoughts? Um, so just to give some perspective on the 22 people we have, we have internationally trained engineers from Venezuela, Portugal, Syria, Israel, um, all on staff right now. And a lot of them came through the Conestoga Career Employment Center. Um, so as a business, we um, have connections there that they help people uh, find the career that they're trained to do. Um, so if you are an internationally trained engineer, sometimes um, from a business perspective, your resume doesn't look like you have any experience that is generally valuable to us um, on paper in the Ontario regulatory field. Um, but we work a lot with the Employment Center because they will 
work with you to either update your skills or they'll make an introduction from you to us that um, will you know, give us more confidence in the fact that you have the skills to learn and your willingness to learn and want to learn. We're always willing to teach. So the biggest thing I look for is attitude and and your ability and, and wantingness to learn. Um, so that's in your positive attitude. That's huge for us. Um, but whether it's partners of empl partners in employment or there's different local things in almost every town and city in Ontario um, that could help you either expand your skills. Maybe it's drafting a better resume um, that might get you an interview quicker or put you into direct contact with an employer. Um, and that's worked personally really well for us. Okay. And Kim, uh, quickly, any, any thoughts on uh, the international community? Uh, yeah, any, any leg up you can get with, you know, Canadian experience helps when we're, when you're screening a thousand resumes, you know, you've got to pick who might be, you know, most effective in the job. So anybody with some particular ex ex um, sorry, explicit experience in the area that you're looking for, they rise to the top. Um, or people who are involved in technical associations or um, like for one example is OWWA, the Ontario Waterworks Association and, and WEAO or WEO is uh, organizations we work with quite a bit. So that can help expand your network if you do have a very specific industry that you want to get into. Um, and then through word of mouth right. uh, and the network, you can get, um, I guess, opportunities to meet people and to interview. Super. And I do appreciate for, for folks you know, PEO is a bit of a, a roadblock uh, at times in terms of, of meeting their requirements and the processes they have in place with respect to licensure. Uh, it's an issue that we at ACEC Ontario are trying to push with them to try and modernize their processes and uh, provide better means of uh, recognizing competencies and so on, rather than the methods they've been using, frankly, for the last 40 years. So it's, um, you know, we, we're, we're doing our best, but it's a uh, large monolithic organization at times. Uh, change is difficult for them, and uh, but we'll, we'll still make those efforts. So. All right, well, we're just about out of time for today, so I'm going to wrap things up. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending this morning's session. We hope you've uh, enjoyed it and been inspired by these accomplished professional engineers. Thank you, Montana, Kim, Michael, for taking the time out of what are clearly very busy days to uh, share your experiences with the folks here. I'd also like to thank OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, for organizing National Engineering Month. And then lastly, a very special thank you to all of the National Engineering Month partners who are too numerous to mention here, but the full list can be found at the website nemontario.ca, which is also where you'll find the schedule for other exciting NEM events this month. There's a good mix of in-person and online events this year. We're finally past COVID enough to do things in person. Uh, so you're bound to find something that's gonna be of interest and perhaps we'll, we'll see you there. So thanks again to our audience. Thanks again to our panelists. Um, it's been a fantastic and informative session and have yourselves a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.